scripture for this. The gathering on Saturday mornings before Sabbath school. That begins at 9.30. Join us for a time of praise as we prepare to study God's word. Do you have little children under the age of five? We are going to be restarting our cradle role of Sabbath school. Vera is going to be leading out in that program along with a ton of great volunteers. So if you have little kids, if you are a little kid, or if you know little ones, please, starting next Sabbath, October 23rd, we are going to be having that cradle role classroom rolling. The Christian Women's Retreat is up at Pacific Union College. It is this weekend and the next. There's probably still time to sneak in to the next weekend. So if you'd like to participate in that event, please go online or talk to Tamara Brown. We are so excited to announce the wedding of Lisa Gomez and Jim McGarry. That is going to be here at the church at 2 p.m. So if you'd like to celebrate with them this incredible blessing of two becoming one, feel free to join them for that celebration. We do have a mask mandate here in Sonoma County, so let's keep each other healthy by wearing those masks while we're on campus. That's it. Thank you for being here. Welcome. Yeah. Good morning. Welcome to the Santa Rosa. Good morning. Welcome to the Santa. Good morning. Welcome to the Santa. Uh, seriously, good morning. I'm glad that you're here to worship with us today. Won't you stand and join us as we sing our opening song, Power in the Blood?
You know what? Sometimes our work week and our week is so busy and so full of too much activity that we come to Sabbath school and we come to church to rest. We come to church to let go of our week's worries and our week's concerns, and we are here to commune with God. And I just want to welcome you this Sabbath day to relax and rest and commune with God. Let's just pray for just a minute. Dear Lord, be with us. Send your presence to relax us. Send us peace and hope in the difficulties of this life um, and, and the blessings too, Lord. Um, but please be with us this Sabbath. Amen. Amen. Um, just a, one big announcement. We're starting Crater Roll class next week. Yay! Yay. <laughs> Auntie Vera Brewington is going to be starting the class at 10 o'clock for the ages of birth to five years old. And anybody is welcome to come. So please make sure that you um, enjoy that class because we're just starting to burst at the seams with children which is a blessing. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. So let us enjoy more music together. Amen. Psalm 105. Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim His name. Make known among the nations what He has done. Sing to Him. Sing praise to Him. Tell of all His wonderful acts. Glory in His holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Stand and rejoice with us today. I invite you. Satisfy me 
It's only through your mercy, oh. 
Father God, it's been a, a scattered week for me, all over the place, highs and lows. Sometimes I've been uncertain what to focus on. And even in my personal prayer life, I've just flitted from one thing to another. And Lord, when I get like that, I feel sometimes inadequate. I feel like I can be doing better. I can be doing more. And especially when I look around me in the world and I look at all of the things that I have no power to fix. When I look at the suffering of our loved ones or our community or those in the world that would seem powerless. 
and there seems like nothing I can do. I'm reminded by you, Lord, that the most important thing I can do in all of these situations is to give it to you. To trust you. To remember, Lord, that you are ultimately in control. That, Lord, if my brothers and sisters need help, the best help that any of us can give them is to pray for them. And in doing that, sometimes you'll guide us to maybe give more physical help. But above all, Lord, we have to give it to you. And so, Lord, as we're here today, praying with our brothers and sisters, Lord, I want to ask everyone to take a moment and pray for them. We don't have to know what they need because you do. And so, Lord, let us and everybody here, I'd ask that you just take a moment. Pray for the person to your left and your right. Pray for the person in front of you and behind you. Knowing that God has us all in his hands. That verse said that my hands are too dirty to raise up to you. That's not true, Father God, and I thank you so much that we don't have to be clean to come to you confidently. That we can come to you and let you cleanse us as you did through Jesus Christ. And then we can be reminded, Lord, that no matter what we think of ourselves, no matter how we've fallen, you value us, you deem us worthy of your love. And I ask that you help us to remember that through this week and to treat others with that same love. Help us today as we hear your word and touch every heart in Jesus' name. Amen. I guess I should. Is this on now? Can you guys hear me? Okay. I guess I should come up here and stand in the light. Um, you guys like the lights to come on? You know, it helps us see the people that are up here on the stage, but. You know, it also, when it's dark outside, it lets us see things out there. Let's just turn on the heaters. Um, if it's too hot, we can turn on the fans. Or if it's cold, if it's cold that season, we can turn, turn heaters on. This is all just sort of a reminder that um, we have a church that, whether we're here or not, whether we come in, just on Sabbath morning, this church is here seven days a week. And this is one of those things that takes money to keep operating. And uh, so this week, our operating is for the church family budget. So uh, we are going to have the deacons circulate during the children's story. And if you have your tithe envelope and you filled it out and it's ready to go in the basket, please do that. But if you haven't had time to get it ready, the deacons are going to keep going. We still have the baskets at the door, so you can put money in there on your way out. Um, i got to see the rest of my notes here. And the last thing, now it's time for our children's story. We'd like to invite all the children to come forward as Pastor Brad has another Tyson story for us.
good morning. Good morning and happy Sabbath. It is so good to see your smiling masks and to have an opportunity to worship with you guys. Now, I want to tell you about a hike that I went on. I was in Colorado recently, and I was walking around the, the sort of foothills of the Rocky Mountains, and as I was walking, out of the corner of my eye, I saw some movement. And there are bears around there, so I turned real quick. I didn't see anything. Just looking for a while, nothing, no animals, nothing. That was strange. It just, there was a fly that flew by my height, so I kept on walking. And as I was walking again, I saw something out of the corner. I turned, nothing. Nothing there. And so I just sat still. I thought, some animal is creeping on me. So I just sat totally still. And I looked. And then out of the Right to the side of my view, I saw out of a hole in the ground a little nose and head pop out. <laughs> and they made some beady eyed look at me, and it was a prairie dog. Have you seen prairie dogs before? They're sort of like hamsters, but like extra large size. And as I sat there totally still watching, out of holes all over the side of the hill, I saw prairie dogs coming up out of their holes and they were scampering around and running and, and peeking their heads out. And what I noticed was, just like that, they were standing up. And, <laughs> and what I noticed was some of the prairie dogs seemed to be very vigilant. They were keeping careful watch. And I looked up later and I found that prairie dogs have a guard. They set watch. And some of the prairie dogs, they, their whole job for hours on end is to watch for danger. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, you know what's amazing? I don't know about you. I don't have any prairie dogs in my life to watch for danger, but I do have something else. Scripture says, the Bible says, thy word is a light unto my path and a lamp unto my feet. That means that the Bible is meant to watch out for us. And <clears throat> when we study the Bible, when we look at God's word, God's word will be our watch prairie dog. We'll keep look all around us, make sure the path before us is clear in life, Make sure the things that we don't want getting into our lives are well accounted for. Let's let the Bible be prairie dog watchdogs for us. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for giving us your word that watches out for us. Thank you for giving us creation that teaches us so much about you. And thank you for these young, precious lives. Bless them each in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to my story. All right, we have a, a couple transfers of membership. For those of you who, who don't know, we have, uh, whenever anyone moves away and transfers their membership to a new church, a new state, a new part of the world, we vote on it to make sure that we are doing our due diligence. And unfortunately, we have a family who has moved away some time ago. Uh, the Kim family, Phil, Kim, and Kim Kim, are transferring their membership uh, out to Tennessee. And Tennessee, right? Yeah, Tennessee, and so is there a motion to accept that transfer of membership? I'm going to count some uh, disgruntled muttering about losing some good friends to another part of the country as a first and a second. All in favor, please say amen. amen. Any opposed, please say amen, I guess. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's, it's part of the, the, 
the joys of promoting people into membership as well as the joys of uh, sending people to serve in other parts of the world in God's church. Now we do have, thank you, wow, holy, wow, holy, how, what happened? We do have a, a, a blessing, though. I want to invite Brandon Manzano to come forward, as well as the elders of the church. Brandon was baptized. He studied with me, along with a group of his friends at Redwood. And come right up here. Brandon was baptized. Mr. Lane, his eighth grade teacher, took care of the actual baptism since I wasn't able to be here. But we have the privilege of welcoming Brandon into fellowship for our church, along with some other people who are going to be baptized shortly and, and those who have been baptized recently. And so, Brandon, we just want to welcome you. We're going to vote you into membership of our church. So is there a motion to accept Brandon into our church family? Amen. So moved and seconded. I want to just invite our church family to stand. So Brandon, your family is here to support you, but your church family is here to support you. That your life would have ample guidance that when you move, there are people to move things. When you need a shoulder to cry on, those shoulders are readily available. And so... We are promising, as we accept you into our church family, to support you as family, to make this place home for you. Amen. All in favor of accepting Brandon into our church family, please say amen. 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 We're going to pray over you, if that's all right. Lord, we just invite your presence to fill Brandon even more powerfully. We are so grateful for the commitment that he has made to you and for the place he has in our church family. We ask that you would bless him richly, that as life rears his head to try to pull him down, that you would lift him up, that you would give our church the strength to lift him up together, that we might be your family here. We thank you for his life. We thank you for his commitment to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Brandon. Brandon. And as just a, a recognition of that, we do have a baptismal certificate, a Bible for you, and a copy of the Desire of Ages. So thank you. Well, happy Sabbath. It is so good to be with you again after some uh, family travels all over the place. For those of you who have been around our church for any amount of time, you might remember I have a younger brother named Dustin, and we got him married off. Some girl signed on the dying line. Praise the Lord. She's, he's her problem now. <laughs> I, uh, on the other hand, have, I, I have a problem that began actually up at Rio Lindo Academy. Uh, for those of you who don't know, right now it is the flag football tournament up at Rio Lindo. And when I was in high school, that was one of my favorite weekends of the year. I loved playing flag football. And I remember my senior year, I was up at Rio Lindo. It was the, the penultimate game of my illustrious, I'll use the word, flag football career. And as I was diving for a flag, one of my teammates, who I shall leave unnamed, dove uh, at the same time and went right into my knee. Dove right on top of my knee. And, and it was awful. They had to cart me off to the sideline, and I could not walk. I remember sitting on the sideline of the last game of my senior year of high school, and I just had to watch from a camp chair. And it was, man, it was brutal. But that was just the beginning of all the ways that my knees would fail me. 
because only a few months later, I was a freshman up at PUC playing basketball in the gym when I came down and my knee went and I knew, oh man, something, something bad has happened. Sure enough, we, we went into the, to Kaiser, now you tore, you ruptured, they use the word ruptured, which is always really uncomfortable to hear about a part of your body. But you've ruptured your ACL, and so they had to take me into surgery there my freshman year of college, and, and I was walking around Pacific Union College, which if you've been up there in Angwin, is, it's all on a hill. So everywhere you go, you're either going downhill on crutches, it was awful. That was just the start, though. I, I recovered slowly, and then, praise God, a, another woman signed on the dotted line, and I became her problem, and we moved to South Dakota to uh, be part of some church families out there, and I was playing city league basketball. It was a ministry, it was great, it was a lot of fun, and and my wife, bless her heart, was pregnant with our second child when during a city league championship game, I, again, I planted on my leg and my other knee went. <laughs> and I went and I immediately knew, I was like, I know this feeling. There's no doubt what's happened. I went in, sure enough, my ACL had ruptured. <laughs> the, that word again, ruptured. And I had to go have uh, replacement surgery for my, my ACL. And my wife would tell you that it was really great because she was 38 weeks pregnant and I went and had knee surgery and couldn't walk. And so she was doing all of this incredibly tender care for me, trying to lift me up steps. And it was really a, a good time in our life. <laughs> my knees have denied me many times of the, the sort of life I had hoped to live, and, and uh, it, it's tough when that happens. I want to talk about denial this Sabbath. In the book of John, we read about the denial of Peter, of Jesus, and, and it begins in a seemingly small way while they are eating a meal. We pick up the story in John chapter 13, verse 36. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Peter begins what will end up in his great denial of Jesus. It, it starts in a place of pride. Jesus has, has just finished telling the disciples that one of them is going to betray him. And so Peter is eager in this moment to prove, I am the best of these men that follow you. I, I would never betray you. I, I'm willing to sacrifice my life in order to serve you. And Jesus, as he so often is, sees right to the heart of Peter and, and understands, you haven't quite got there yet, buddy. In fact, that's going to bear itself out today, that very night. Denial in this context means to affirm that one has no connection to someone else. Meaning, Jesus is saying, no, Peter, not only are you not going to lay your life down, three times you will deny even having an association with me, even having any connection with me whatsoever. So I'll be honest, as I thought about this, I started thinking about what does it really mean to deny? You know, it seems like this incredibly big moment for Peter. You know, it's this pivotal thing where he, he denies, as we'll soon read, Jesus three times as he's on the way to the cross. Like, it seems massive, like something that maybe only happens once a lifetime. 
And yet, when I really think about the language of Scripture here, that language of denial, that suddenly, just acting in a way as if I have no association with Jesus, that is different, right? That doesn't seem as grand. Because there are times in my life where I act like I'm not associated with Jesus. I don't know about you, but there are times in life where I get busy. And I will wake up one day and realize, wow, I can't remember the last time I really sat down and read Scripture. Is that not in some way a denial of having it? I know it was just busyness that got me there, but I still lived a lot life like I wasn't associated with it. There are choices that we make that if we really are honest with ourselves are a denial that we have chosen otherwise to be associated with Jesus. I would put to you that Denying Jesus is something we do a lot. Something maybe we do daily or weekly in small and great ways. And so I think we can look at Peter's story of denial and we can perhaps find a way back, learn how it is that we can not just Try to, like Peter, oh, no, Lord, you don't understand. I'm the best of Christians. No one is as good at being a Christian as me. I would lay my life down rather than deny you, rather than betray you. But rather, perhaps learn like Peter, the humility of coming back, of just how do we return to the Lord when we realize we've been living in a way that denies him? Peter finds himself following Jesus in John chapter 18 after he has been, Jesus has been arrested. Scripture tells us that he followed Jesus and so did another disciple, John, when you read his gospel, he tries to be a little bit coy, but he's just talking about himself. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he's trying not to brag, but we get it, like, you know the high priest, you have friends now, okay. He entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter stood outside the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl, who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. So here they are, they're following Jesus as he's being taken before the high priest for his sham of a trial. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you. Also, are, are you not one of this man's disciples? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was warm, and they were warming, and, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. So look at what's happening for Peter in just the course of a couple hours, right? He's with Jesus at the, the Last Supper, and oh, I would, I would. Not only would I never deny you, I would lay my life down for you. Now, a servant girl who really, I, I mean, I don't want to be, I don't want to be rude, but I wonder how sort of uh, uh, dangerous she seemed. Maybe John meant to say like she was a vicious servant girl with knives all over her body. I don't know. So maybe we should give Peter some of the benefit of the doubt. But the language here seems to suggest that a teenage girl was guarding the door. And here in the face of that threat, Peter has gone from, I'll lay my life down for you, to, uh, Jesus. Now, how do you spell that exactly? <laughs> right? I mean, this is dramatic. Jesus goes into his trial, but the story of Peter continues in verse 25 of John chapter 18. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. Remember, now he's by this fire. He's made it past the servant girl with a, just a little white line, right? Ah, Jesus, who's that? It's not, it's not a real denial. You know, it, it, it was, there was no, there was nothing on the line. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't around other Christians, so it was fine. But now he's He's warming himself by this fire, and the guards are there, and, and other servants of the high priest are there. And they say to him, 
You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. And Peter now, he, he's, he's opened up the door and he's just immediately, no, <laughs> a disciple. No, 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 no. I, Jesus, I, I, I saw him one time in Capernaum, but it wasn't, it wasn't, everybody was doing it. It wasn't a big deal. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, which was a whole thing. We'll, we'll, we'll cover that story on another day. Peter cut off a guy's ear. Jesus put it back on. It happens. Anyway. <laughs> said to him, did I not see you in the garden with him? Which, yeah, I mean, if this guy's brother's ear was cut off, he's just, you know, you do look familiar. <laughs> Peter again denied it. And at once, a rooster crowed. So here... Within the course of hours, Peter has gone from, I will lay my life down, to three times. I don't even, I, I have no association with Jesus. My, my life has nothing to do with him. Again and again, Peter has come to this place. Jesus will be crucified. Later on, Peter and the rest watching it all in horror. And I, you can't, it's hard to fathom what that experience was like for Peter specifically. That, that the last thing that he will have done in the life of Jesus was to deny even knowing him. I don't know what that Sabbath was like for Peter when Jesus was resting in the tomb, but I'm guessing he didn't get a lot of rest. And then Jesus is resurrected. And, and Peter is, in this classic way, is going out of his way as soon as he gets a chance to be with Jesus again to try to prove his zeal, prove how sorry he is, prove how much he, he cares for Jesus. Jesus meets the disciples, some of the disciples, as they're fishing, and he, he prepares breakfast for them on the beach. For those of you who got a chance to have breakfast with us today, thank you so much. And, and for those of you who prepared breakfast, Daphne and, and Vera and, and so many others, thank you. That was awesome. Uh, I'm looking forward to my breakfast plate that's somewhere else. When they finished eating that breakfast that Jesus prepared for them, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, I want to pause for a moment. So, in the Bible, in the New Testament specifically, there are three words in the Greek language that it was originally written in for love. And for our reading today, it's really critical that you have some grasp of that. The, the first word is this word eros. And today we might use that word like we might say lust. It is sort of the, the, the love that is expressed physically. And in scripture, that's the word. If it's physical, love, lust, it, it's eros. Now there's another word, philo, like Philadelphia, which means brotherly love. You might say affection or fondness. And, and, and so sometimes in the Bible a word will be translated love, but it is actually this, this philo. And then there is a third word, and it's agape. Probably some of you have heard that one before. Agape is this selfless love. It is the, the word that the Bible uses to describe the self-sacrificial love of God for us. Agape. So as we're reading this, I'm going to kind of fill you in because our Bibles will just say love, but actually multiple words are used in this passage, and it really transforms how you read it. So Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Jesus uses the word agape. Do you, do you Peter, do you have the kind of self-sacrificial love that you told me that you had for me at dinner the other day? I'll lay my life down. Jesus is asking him, now that you've denied me, you've gone through this experience, do you have that love for me? 
Peter said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. That word love that Peter responds with is not agape, though. He says, Philea, yes, Lord, you know that I am fond of you. Yes, Lord, you, you know that I am affectionate for you. It, it is the epitome of, or it is the equivalent of, you know, you, you're in a new relationship. The moment has come. Maybe it's she, maybe it's he, maybe it's, it's one or the other. Someone says, I love you first. And it is a moment of tension. Are they going to say, thank you? <laughs> Are they going to Han Solo it and say, I know? <laughs> Are they going to say, I love you? Are they going to say, oh, <laughs> me too? Yeah. yeah. Right? So this is what's happening. Jesus is saying, Simon, do you love me? Are you willing to lay your life down for me now? And Simon says, Lord, you know that I am so fond of you. Oof. It continues. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Jesus said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Agape, do you have that selfless love for me? Jesus is really pressing him. Are you willing to lay your life down for me? He said to him, Peter did, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you, Phileo. And you know that I'm fond of you. You know that I think of you like a brother. And there is this immense tension that's going on here. Jesus has come to the man who's denied him, who previously said he would give up his life for him. And he's asking him if he's ready to make that commitment anew. And Peter has learned something troubling and terrible about himself. He, Peter is in this moment saying, I don't know if I can get there, Jesus. I, I, do you know what I've done? I don't know if I can make that commitment because I know I failed before. Jesus says to him again, tend my sheep. Verse 17, Jesus said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Jesus uses the word Philip this time. Do you, are you fond of me? Do you think of me as a brother? Jesus is meeting Peter where he is. In this, in this moment. It, it, it is incredible. Jesus is, has, he began with saying, are you willing to get on my level? I laid my life down for you. You said you would lay your life down for me. I did. You didn't. Are you ready to get on that level? And, and Peter said, no. I, I don't know if I can. And so Jesus then takes the next step. Okay. Peter, this third time. Are you fond of me? Do you, do you think of me like a brother? And you see how Peter responds. He said to him a third time, he's grieved. Do you love me? Peter said to him, Lord, you know everything. I mean, he, you see what Peter, he, he understands what's happened now. He understands that Jesus gets it. He, he, Jesus knows exactly what Peter did. He's having this aha moment. It's the third time. Just like I denied Jesus three times, you can almost see the sweat beginning to, to bead at, on, on Peter's forehead as the memories are replaying, as the guilt fills him, as he is experiencing anew what he felt as Jesus took his final breaths knowing that he had denied him. And he, he is experiencing that grief, but he is also realizing what Jesus is doing. That as Jesus is giving him an opportunity to return to him, he is not asking Peter to take the last step. Jesus is saying, I will take the, I'll take the next step. I'll be the one with the selfless love. 
I know you thought you could do it. I know you wanted to do it, but, but you didn't. And you realize that. So I'm going to be the selfless love. Are you willing to give me your affection, your fondness, to, to call me your brother? And Peter is, you know everything. You know that I love you. He is recommitting. Finally, Leo, I will do that. I'll, I'll, I'll return to you here at this point. And, and this restoration is beautiful because Peter... In so many different ways, there's so much going on in this passage. Jesus brings him the, the three opportunities to return in the same way that Peter had three opportunities to deny him. Jesus is giving him two opportunities to recognize where he's fallen short. And then reveals to him that third time, I'm going to step into the gap you left. But Jesus doesn't leave him there. Feed my sheep, he says. Jesus is, is giving him a path forward. We pick it up in 18. Truly, truly, I say to you, Jesus says, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said, to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Now, I know that perhaps on first read through, this seems a bit like a non sequitur, doesn't it? I mean, what, we had this beautiful moment, there was love, the three times that we went through it. What is Jesus talking about, being young and old? And, and... Jesus is saying to him, look, you're young. I get it. I understand where you're at. But he's saying there will come a day when you're old. And he's not talking so much about his sort of numeric age. He's talking about his, his faith maturity. He's saying when they will dress you and carry you to where you do not want to go. He's, he's saying to him, Scripture points out that the death he would go through to glorify God. Peter was eventually, we know from history, crucified in the name of Jesus. Crucified upside down, history would tell us, because he didn't feel worthy of being crucified the same way that Jesus was. Jesus is saying to Peter, I know you didn't get to that self-sacrificial love. I'll be there for you. And it's okay. It's okay to be where you're at. You're, you're new in your faith. You're young in your faith. There is a place for you to grow. And eventually, you're going to get there. Eventually, you're going to get to the place where you are willing to lay your life down for me. And Peter did. And, and the path that Jesus describes for Peter is simple. Follow me. Feed my sheep. Just serve the people I serve. And in so doing, it will develop in you the heart that I have. And will bring you to that place of the agape love. The, the, the love for Jesus that Jesus has for us. So how do we return to Jesus when we deny him? When our lives... We live and act as if we have no association with him. Well, the first thing we, we have to be understanding of is like Peter, Jesus comes to us. And, and in fact, Jesus is not just ready to meet us where we left him, but Jesus is ready to take steps to where we are. Right? Peter and Jesus, they separate at the point of Peter saying, I have a God made love for you. I'll lay down my life for you. When we deny Jesus, Jesus is not waiting for us back at the life we used to have, back at the faith we used to have, where we have to sort of work ourselves back into the, the piety that we used to have. Jesus is waiting at our side wherever we are. We, we 
don't have to get back. We just need to be where we are because Jesus is there. Returning to Jesus is simply a matter of turning to Jesus. He, he's, there's not some path to get there. It's now. And, and that is the beautiful thing Jesus shows Peter, shows us. In that moment like Peter where we realize, yeah, I messed up. Jesus is waiting there. He's waiting there to tell us, I know. And I have a way forward. Are you willing to love me however you are able to right now? Doesn't have to be the agape, but are you willing to just treat me with affection and fondness? Are you willing to just take the simple steps? We can start there. And the path forward is always the same. Just, just follow me. You don't have to get to the top of that hill and then you can walk with me. Just follow me now. I will get you. What's what Jesus is saying to Peter? I will get you where you need to be. I'll get you. Just serve the people I care about. It really is that simple. I wish I had some like incredibly technical, you know, something to give you, but actually it is that simple. It's simply just accepting the grace that Jesus is offering, wherever we are, for whatever it is. Maybe it's been a while since you've been in church, that's okay. Jesus is here with you now, and he is, he is ready to accept you where you're at, and walk with you to where he's taking you. Maybe it's been a while since you've really been committed to your relationship, your spouse, family. Jesus is with you now, and he's willing to walk with you where you need to be. Maybe it's been a while since you've prayed. Maybe it's been a while since you've read your Bible. Maybe it's been a while since you've tithed. Maybe it's been a while since you've worshipped. Maybe it's been a while since you've forgiven those who have wronged you. Maybe it's been forever since you've accepted forgiveness yourself. Jesus is next to us now. He's meeting us now. We just say okay. Let us pray together. Lord, we are so grateful that you are not some distant waypoint we must strive and struggle to reach. You are the very next step on the path. And so we ask, like Peter, that we would see that you are next to us. That you would, we would see you are extending a hand of grace. That you are meeting us where we are ready to take us where you want us to be. Lord, we are here to accept that selfless love. We are here to give you whatever we are able to, and we are here to trust that you will take care of the rest. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Seven. Seven.